Uh, the Jaipur Literature Festival has Zomato as one of its sponsors and we're running a contest called the Zomato Hot Seat. Some of you may be familiar with it from the last couple of days. So at this time, uh, please turn around and examine your chair. If you find a red Zomato sticker there and it has been found, congratulations, congratulations. Please just come up here to the front of the stage and collect your prize. You are a winner of the Zomato Hot Seat Contest. Well done. Excellent news, excellent news. So moving on to introducing the session which we're just about to start in a minute. The session is titled Culture and Resilience. It is presented to you by the Mahindra World City Jaipur. Before I introduce the session and the speakers, uh, we have a short video from the sponsor which we'd like you to watch. So let's please play the Mahindra World City Jaipur video. Any second now. And thank you to Mahindra World City Jaipur for presenting this session to all of us. Again, Culture and Resilience is the title of this next session. Uh, culture is something that can be difficult to define, but one of the ways in which we can look at it is that it is the glue that holds society together. In this session, we will be exploring the narratives um, driven by culture and cultural narratives, the bonds and communities created by it, and how we can uh, lead to cultural resistance and how resili resilience is imbued by the arts. In conversation will be Jamie Andrews, who is the head of culture and learning at the British Library. He'll be joined by Pavan K. Varma, who is, of course, a former, former, former diplomat, writer, and politician. He's done extensive writing on culture and communities, including recent publications on two icons of Indian heritage, Chanakya and Adi Shankara. Pratyusha Agarwal will also be on the stage. She is the Chief Marketing Officer or CMO of Z, and would describe herself as the champion of the voice of the great Indian middle class. Raghavendra Singh. Uh, will be also on the stage. He is, of course, the former Secretary, Ministry of Culture for India, and currently the CEO of Development of Museums and Cultural Spaces. Along with that, he has published books on the Northwest Frontier Province, is currently working on a few more, and has worked on restoring over a dozen iconic monuments and buildings across India. Finally, there's Sabha Nakvi, of course, a renowned author, journalist, and commentator. And also the author of four books, including In Good Faith on Cultural Pluralism and the tradition, uh, Syncretic Traditions of India. They will all be in conversation with Sanjoy K. Roy, of course, Managing Director of Teamwork Arts and the man who kicked off the festival on this very stage two days ago. Please welcome them with a huge round of applause. Thank you. Thank you so much, Pratish. Thank you all for being part of this panel. Uh, we are celebrating 70 years of India's constitution tomorrow. And I think the world, 71st, and the world and India has come a long way. And one of the things I really want each of you to reflect on is the culture and the need for resilience, irrespective of the times and irrespective of the politics of this period. Pavan, let me start by asking you, because you've been board director general of ICCR, presided as a bureaucrat over some of India's cultural brand uh, outside of the country. Uh, you've been a member of parliament of the Rajya Sabha. You've been an advisor to the chief minister of Bihar. But most importantly, you've also been an author of a whole series of books, which in many ways has taken and translated the culture of a particular time and, and brought it into a present day context. How important is literature in the play of culture and resilience? And also, what does the constitution of India represent as far as our Indian culture goes? The answer to your second question is very clear. The constitution of India, whose adoption we will celebrate tomorrow, guarantees freedom of expression. Freedom of expression is the foundation of creativity. And all those who reject that freedom also reject creativity. So therefore, this is something which was part of the vision of our founding fathers. 
and there is no force that can take away that freedom which is guaranteed to us by the idealism of our forefathers who fought for our freedom struggle and is endorsed by the constitution of India. That is your strength. Never fail to remember that. <laughs> Secondly, you asked me about literature and resilience. You see, something is very important here. Culture can become an animating force to generate resilience if you are dynamically in touch with your cultural roots. If there is an amnesia or if there is lack of understanding or memory about what that culture is, then somewhere even that resilience will suffer. Let me give you quickly two or three examples and you can stop me whenever you like. For instance, in literature, we have the Bhagavad Gita. The Bhagavad Gita says, Krishna says to Arjun, do what you think is right. Do your karm. Don't think about the reward. There may not be an immediate link between action and reward in conventional terms. So don't think of the reward. Have the courage of conviction to do what you think is right. Now, it was written thousands of years ago, but it was a hugely inspiring icon of resilience for Mahatma Gandhi. When he was fighting the British, the most powerful military machine at that time in the world, he was largely and he has, he has confessed to the fact that he was guided by the vision of the Bhagavad Gita which is part of our inherited legacy, which said, do what you think is right. That's a mantra. Do what you think is right, irrespective of the consequences. The second is, and I'll quickly take 30 seconds more. You see, you must know your culture. If you don't know it, you can't fight what is wrong. In recent times, there has been a distortion of the entire image of Maryada Purushottam Lord Ram. If anyone has read Tulsi Das's Ram Charit Manas and you were talking of literature, Maryada Purushottam Ram in our literature, whether it's Valmiki or Tulsi Das, is the epitome of rectitude. He does what is ethical, again irrespective of consequences. So here is Ram saying to Bharat, and the lines are evocative, you must churn them in your mind. He says, Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par hit, the welfare of others. There is no good greater than that. Par hit saris dharam nahi bhai. Par pida sam nahi atmai. And there is no greater evil than injury to others. This is Maryada Purushottam Ram saying to Bharat. And today we have situations where people crying out Jai Shri Ram have weaponized his name and publicly lynched people in public places chanting Jai Shri Ram which is a travesty and distortion of my religion. Because they don't know their own cultural roots. The same thing with Urdu literature. You are talking of literature. When Mirza Ghalib says and I, and I especially address this to the many young people, and I'm not politicizing this, who have the courage of conviction to voice what they think is wrong. They are looking up to law enforcing authorities who have on many occasions indulged in excesses. They are using Ghalib's line, Mat pooch ki kya haal hai mera tere piche. Mat pooch ki kya haal hai mera tere piche. Tu de ki kya rang hai tera mere aage. So that, don't look at me, mat pooch ki kya hal, don't see what, what my condition is in your overpowering presence. You see where you stand when I am facing you. So that is the strength which comes from sources of literature. Another poet just said, katl ki jab usna di dhamki mujhe, katl ki, 
कत्ल की जब उसने दी धमकी मुझे द यंग आर सिंह कह दिया हमने भी देखा जाएगा देखा जाएगा वेन ई थ्रेटन टू गिलोटीन मी आई लुक टेट हिम स्माइल्ड एंड सेट वी शेल सी हम देखेंगे हम देखेंगे प्रत्युषा वन ऑफ द थिंग्स दैट पवन टच अपॉन इज दैट यू नीड टू नो एंड हैव योर रूट्स इन कल्चर यू नीड टू नो योर स्टोरीज यू बीन डूइंग अ लॉट ऑफ रिसर्च ऑन द होल एस्पेक्ट ऑफ स्टोरीज नॉट जस्ट इन द वे दैट वी सी स्टोरीज हियर बट दोज अनोन एंड अनहर्ड ऑफ स्टोरीज फ्रॉम द विलेजेस ऑफ आंध्र एंड द विलेजेस ऑफ उड़ीसा वॉट हैव यू डिस्कवर्ड एंड वॉट्स द काइंड ऑफ फीडबैक दैट यू ऑल गेट एंड हाउ डू यू ब्रिंग दैट टू द फोर इन अ वे दैट मेक्स इट entertaining and continues to take it out into a different world yeah i'll uh, get on to the uh, thing of stories but i just wanted to you know talk about you'll have to just if you hold it like that yeah, yeah. okay um so the thing is when we are telling stories ultimately we're taking the culture of that land and bringing forward and connecting to people through that culture right so just want to step one step back and think what really is culture and uh, somewhere does it need to be resilient or thriving when does a culture thrive is really when it is of the people by the people and it is we the people the zeitgeist of the current is what we really at zc as culture so i'll uh, you know uh, uh, to quote nelson mandela when you talk to a person in a language uh, he understands it goes to his mind and when you talk to him in his language it goes to his heart we believe that when you talk to her in her boli it goes to her soul and what do we really mean yeah that boli what does that boli mean um uh, i'll give you a very nice so, so for color. those of you boli is a, is in a sense a dialect boli is is a yeah. is a way of communicating let's look at uh, how people say death or somebody died in different english language uh, indian languages okay um so if you are from mumbai they say off ho gaya off what i am i a resource am i a mechanical machine who is available as a resource that ab off ho gaya kuch nahi kar sakta yeah versus um that's from the perspective here and similarly in andhra it will be chani poyaru which is he's left us which is all the perspective of this land where i am there versus um, if you look at in a up you would say bhagwan ko pyare ho gaye guzar gaye you're looking at it from the perspective of the other meaning land. you become dear to god right. or you've passed over or to another land so there's very different perspectives on death and the most interesting thing we've heard in an mp indor is shant ho gaye shant meaning it's at peace you are at peace yeah it's about the person's perspective and so we really see culture of each region and this land is so vibrant and so diverse that that culture not the language the culture changes every 100 kilometers so we really looking at understanding the soul so the sthit pragna of a kannadatana which is very you know uh, measured and i'm okay you are okay and let's understand it together versus a karwa khanda kind of a jasba in punjab which is a very different culture to a bebak pana which is in up so we trying to get this as culture through our stories so um somewhere we see a unity that happens at an underlying innate truth in stories but when you get this character you connect a lot more and then there are no differences anymore jamie um uh, she was talking about how cultures change every 100 kilometers especially in places like india and of course across the world and how different dialects or bolis marry that together in many different ways all of that finally comes to rest in the great libraries of the world the crucibles as we talked about yesterday uh, of of collective memory collective culture how important do you think libraries are because the narrative that we hear is libraries are dying libraries are going to finish and yet we know that most books today that have anything to do with history tend to have some kind of source material from the british library so in the context of 
of India, where there's so many stories uh, that have traveled from here into your archives, sometimes to be buried forever, and occasionally to be discovered, rediscovered, like we talked about Navdeep Suri's Kuni by Saki, where you were able to take it out. So tell us how you feel and how you see the role of the great libraries of the world, or libraries of the world. Uh, absolutely. I, I think there is the narrative. It's the mistaken narrative, but there is clearly uh, a narrative that libraries are uh, no longer relevant, that perhaps, uh, as you say, they're dying. And it couldn't be, it couldn't be less true. Uh, it's, it's astounding. We still, in the UK, get around 250 million visits to our libraries. That's not just the British Library, but it's that wonderful network of libraries across the towns, the cities, and the rural areas. Uh, 250 million visits in the last year, and I think I saw a statistic of something like 3.4 billion visits to libraries across the world. Now, it's impossible to calculate, but these are massive numbers. They are still utterly relevant. And it's interesting to me that where there aren't libraries, where there are spaces where there aren't libraries, people are creating them. Where the libraries don't exist, people are feeling the need for them. And so more and more, certainly in the UK and across the world, you find these unexpected libraries cropping up on street corners, in bus stops, in, in phone booths. People still feel the need. And I think the reason for that is, is partly about the collections, of course. Uh, we're hearing about stories. We are uh, a memory palace. We are uh, a crucible of stories. Uh, and those collections are vital to what libraries are. But actually, I think, as much as anything, it's about being a physical space. And, you know, everyone says we're in a digital world and that physical spaces uh, uh, are withdrawing from, from, from public life. Again, that's not true. The more digital things are, the more immaterial. Actually, people want to come to these public spaces to be together. Libraries are utterly open and inclusive. There are no real barriers to accessing libraries. If you look at the UK culture scene, the diversity of the audiences in libraries is far, far outstrips the diversity of audiences any, in any other kind of art form. So these are places where people feel comfortable, they come to be with other people, they come to be alone, to think and to reflect. Uh, and those, those values are utterly indispensable uh, today. Thank you. R Raghavendra, great institutions, great monuments. When you were culture uh, secretary and even more recently now as the CEO of Heritage and Museums, you've actually been in the forefront of restoring some of the great monuments that have fallen to disrepair. You took me to Calcutta last week or a couple of weeks ago and you showed me uh, the, the old treasury building where they demolished the great dome, but you've been able to restore part of the building. Why is it important for us to preserve heritage and what is its association with culture of the times? Over the last uh, <clears throat> so many years, uh, we have actually, um, uh, how should I put it, uh, most of our uh, cultural heritage is either looked after by the Archaeological Survey of India or the State Archaeological Department. Uh, both these uh, departments uh, are actually not looked up to within the government circles and the perception also outside is more or less the same. So it's a punishment post. Pardon? It's a punishment post. You could in a way say that. Uh, people who are already there, right? Uh, they have also been bound by some uh, archaic, um, you know, sections in the laws that we have. I mean, I'll just take the example of, say, Red Fort uh, or uh, the old currency building which you saw. Uh, now, these are all iconic places. We all know that. But to make them vibrant, you have to have people coming in. Now, if you do something where people just come and see the place as it is and go away without having an engaging experience, of course, keeping in mind uh, the sensitivities of that place, then you need to sort of add on to those places. Say, for example, in the old currency building, which was actually a building which was crumbling, perhaps it wouldn't have seen more than three or four uh, 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 you know, seasons of uh, rain. In Kolkata, as you know, it sort of rains incessantly. 
uh, there was there were trees and there were plants coming out of that building and and so the, you had to restore it at this moment we have perhaps the best museum on bengal art which has come up there it's world standard in terms of display now obviously then people will start to come how many of you are here from calcutta have you all been to this uh, to the museum with the new exhibition it's, it's just it's fantastic come up. amazing it's just come up truly, about a week amazing. back and i was there 3 days ago just to sort of see it again and uh, every day the footfall is increasing i have also told our friends from the media especially the print media to go and see it for themselves and write whatever they feel like but raghavendra tell us why is it that the state of the of the indian museum in whether it's in delhi the national museum or in calcutta or whether chola bronzes is in chennai is in such a state of disrepair and what is again the responsibility and perhaps your vision in bringing this back to the fore and really displaying it and and doing the research say like the british museum does or the vna does or any of the great museums in the world is it one one great thing which has just recently happened is <clears throat> uh we were very lucky uh we have actually uh, decided the prime minister has announced that we would actually uh refurbish and restore and bring it up to the world standards all five museums which we have under our mandate indian museum is one now why has it not happened the reason why it has not happened is like for example if you want to actually develop the health sector and you don't have doctors how do you develop it right so similarly we don't have proper conservators we don't have proper curators we don't have people who are experts at visitor experience or on the issue of security so we are now exponentially going to increase the number of people coming out increase the number of courses uh, get faculty from outside put in more funding so the indian institute of heritage the conservation the government can't do it but the government can't do it it is going to do it sir you may say it you may say it you may have been in the government and you may be pessimistic but i'm not sabha something that jamie said um uh, street corners across the world whether it's been um taking from nilanjana's article from occupy wall street to shaheen bag uh, from hong kong to wherever have really become this incredible um uh, outpouring of creativity uh, much of the resistance that we are seeing during the arab spring at tahri square for example both in hong kong and in new york you saw this incredible churning that was coming out by young people and artisans and so on and so forth can you reflect on some of that and the culture in many ways the resilience and today the finding of a voice and the reflection of that by artists uh thank you sanjoy and uh, i'm very happy to be here first when we talk about culture i'll just make a point it, we don't have such a diverse culture anywhere else in the world open the indian currency notes and note the number of languages there where else do you have such a remarkable country in the uk from where jamie has come and spoken about the importance of libraries which i entirely agree with uh is uh, you you have a problem with the scots perhaps they want to secede now big from the uk and uh, you you have diversity but nothing on the scale they all still have the same script and the same language we are a country show me another country which has so many languages so many scripts and then you will know what is the miracle that is india the miracle that has to be preserved that is india which is what you spoke of that is the beauty having said that so we are culturally vibrant there's not going to be one culture one uh, which is going to be imposed on india at all there has been an attempt in recent years to kill to uh, isolate and to push out a section of indian citizens and now there was there, there was some legislation which was passed this is not a political platform so let me say this uh, there the last straw on the camel's back broke and now today you have some of the most creative protests taking place across india please go and take a look at the artwork they are producing look at the street art go to my twitter handle you will see there is fabulous street art that is being produced 
It is almost as if the progressive writers' movement has found its soul again. It is stirring. You are finding poets appearing from students. They are, you are finding public speakers appearing. This is a cultural sort of outpouring which is happening on, in the streets of India, in parts of India. However, since you mentioned China and Hong Kong, it, India is so and America, diverse. And, and America. And America. And it's so diverse. I'm talking largely about Delhi. I'm talking about locations such as Shaheen Bagh and the Jami Masjid. And now women are sitting at seven other locations. Indian women are sitting at seven other places in, this, in the capital of Delhi. And but when you talk about China, let's just remember one thing. Let's go a little bit into Uttar Pradesh. 23 Indians have been shot dead. The Chinese protests, two. The death toll is two. We have killed well, Hong Kong, Hong Kong protests, Hong Chinese sorry, protests. Sorry. Hong, the, in Muslims, Hong Kong, a million were in Hong Kong, two people have died. In Uttar Pradesh, 23 have died. You know, with bullets. So, I mean, let's not forget these. So we we are a country where you can have great atrocities also that can happen, but great protests. And Pavan mentioned, "Ham dekhenge." And let me just say this: when you're talking about a cultural renaissance, when I talk about the progressive writers' movement, and I talk, where did the great poetry of India come from? Before Fares Ahmed Fares, who I had the occasion to be in the room with when I was a child, and uh, he was holding a drink in his hand, and he was sitting in the drawing room in Delhi. Before that, there was Sahir Lyudhyanbi, who gave us was Phir Subha Kabhi To Aayegi. Who gave us all the lovely songs? Sahir gave us, Majru gave us, uh, Javed's uncle, Majaz gave us. They were all belonged to the progressive writer stream. You have a bit of that coming alive again. So that's... Pa Pavan, um... Does India's culture represent Gandhi's non-violence, or have we always been a fairly violent people? You see, it's not a binary between violence and non-violence. It's a cultural lifestyle which privileges coexistence. You have to understand that beyond the formal text, if, as I quoted yesterday, if the Upanishads have the audacity of thought thousands of years ago to say ekam satya vipraha bahuda vadanti the truth is one wise people call it by different names it's an assertion of eclecticism of inclusion of broad mindedness but leave that apart how does culture translate in the manner in which we live every day and what is the resilience that lifestyle gives to us. Can you produce an exquisite sari from Banaras without the cooperation of Hindus and Muslims? You can't. Can you produce an exquisite carpet in Mirzapur without a centuries old cooperation between Hindus and Muslims? Do you know that many of the Hindu icons are painted and sculpted for centuries now by Muslim craftsmen. They are in our temples. Do you know that in spite of the fact that religions can be different, but they need to be bound by respect, mutual respect, you have Indians of all hues in different ways participating in each other's religious functions, not as a mandatory, exercise but out of the tradition of cultural practice. It is happening in our country. You don't go to Sabrimala without stopping at a Dargah as well. The followers of Shirdi Sai Baba are Hindus and Muslim, whether you believe in him or not. These are syncretic practices whereby we have lived a cultural lifestyle which illustrates what Jawaharlal Nehru wrote in his first letter to chief ministers in India in 1948 when he said, in India, coexistence is not an option but a compulsion. He articulated that in 48, but for 1,500 years before that, people of India have been living together. Look at the Taj Mahal. Tell me which motif is purely Islamic and which is Hindu. It is a synthesis which has evolved over time. Now this is how cultures are lived.
therefore there is a sarkari version of culture and even worse there is a distorted sarkari version of culture sarkari mean government uh, translation version of culture so the government translation of culture comes head on face on with culture as lived by people for centuries now which does not validate hate as the only recognition of the republic of india it validates love it validates understanding it valid validates inclusion it validates the fact that we are all part of the same national mainstream and it's a lived culture it can't be imposed what is being imposed is the division and that lived culture gives us the resilience to those who are trying to force division on us jamie is culture a luxury and why do governments sometimes look at this as the last thing on their priority list well two two parts to that is culture a luxury i'm reminded of raymond williams who defined culture as being ordinary the complete the complete opposite of that uh, no culture is open to everyone uh, and it's inside us as well our own creativity creates that culture um in terms of government funding and i i can't talk with any uh, any detail no, on the indian situation talk, talk in, about the but, UK. In, but in the uk it's true to say that there have been reductions across the board and that sometimes when you're looking for perhaps easy cuts people turn to the culture department uh, 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 early on actually although uh, certainly our institution has had some real term cuts we've also found new ways of generating money and that's no bad thing i don't think that culture institutions should be 100% reliant on government funding by having that mixed economy by of course having that core investment from government but actually by, by being creative by creating your own income streams if you like uh, and also going and getting different forms of support and sponsorship i think that gives you a robustness it means that you're not directly answerable to or reliant on government and it creates i think a far more interesting mix but i think the second point and i don't think that i don't think that you should make a solely economic case for culture that's utterly reductive but on the other hand if you did make an economic case for culture it stacks up really really well uh, if you look at the creative industries in the uk which are powered by cultural institutions large and small they're a massive part of the economy a growing part of the economy 100 million pounds a year this is really important so money invested in culture does actually produce greater returns so while i wouldn't necessarily stress the economic argument because there are bigger more transcendent things at play actually there is a really strong economic argument and the government and the culture department is really cottoning onto that i i need to introduce you to the present tourism minister here who doesn't think this contributes very much but on for that um pratisha social media today social media started dictating in many ways the way we look uh, at at the culture or the culture that surrounds us what is how do you say, has it been a distortion has it been used in a, in many ways to be able to take the voice of those who've never had an opportunity and spread it out um i'm so glad you brought that point out because when we were repeatedly talking about culture as this to be preserved and you know physical artifact versus i think uh, like sabha spoke in india it's not so much a it's not in one language right it's a spoken culture that gets passed on and hence it's pretty much alive in a living breathing form and social media today is that very living breathing form i think there are different kinds of social media uh, there is some there are some which are like the echo chambers where there is something that's put out and the same thing gets repeated over and over again versus there is some and uh, maybe if you take tiktok for example i don't know how many of you are on tiktok you will see a thriving narrative of the bhedadak bharat this is a country i mean for god sake you will see carpenter showcasing their work to a bollywood song they just want to get on with life and have a better life tomorrow that's the culture of india are they really wanting to um 
look into the divide, look into how different we are. No, they're just wanting to get along and go forward, go forth and thrive as a nation. That's what you see where you want to see on social media. So I think it's the more we look at somebody dictating a narrative versus when we, and again, go back to the democratized form of culture. I'm really here as a representative of that pop culture, not really the cultured culture, if I might say so. So there, I really don't see anybody dictating the narrative. If you see the trends that happen, it's a lot more about people wanting to get on and thrive in this land. Uh, Sabha, is, the, is there a difference between pop culture and culture culture? And should there be a difference? And what is that so in today's? I think, I think what Jamie is talking about, uh, look, the, um, the British Empire, they have a lot of documents to preserve. And none of us could do any historical research if he didn't keep the British Library going. <laughs> you know, they, you've taken all our documents and you're sitting there in the UK, so, but that's another argument we're going to have. <laughs> but we all really want you to preserve them well, because I'm not sure we're doing such a great job here, you know? We really want you to preserve them well. And uh, the problem, uh, the re look, when you go to the UK, when you go to London, you go to the museums and the libraries, what is a tourism itinerary in India? It's you go to Agra, you go to Jaipur, and you, I mean, some people may go to the National Museum. It's not there in our culture. But you can also go to Delhi Heart, which in, you can in go some to Delhi, ways yeah. also represents yeah, popular culture. Or, or the craft culture. Yeah, the craft, arts, and popular culture. So I think Jamie is the person who's doing the most important job. And when we all start arguing over history and who did Ambedkar belong to and who did, we have to go through his library to find those documents, you know? But having said that, I just want to move on to, uh, to uh, if I may take this time, for, you were asking me whether culture is... Uh, pop culture, what pop she culture. said, pop and so culture So there culture. is high culture. Uh, to take off from some of the points that Pavan was making about, he was giving you these lovely examples of pluralism. My first book was on such examples and it was basically about uh, these popular cultures, but that does not take away from the necessity to create platforms and to create museums to preserve high culture. Let's make a distinction here. We also need to preserve all that. And it is even in high culture, classical Indian music, you will find the, um, there is no musical gharana of classical music which does not have syncretic plural past. Nothing. You know, Baba Alauddin teaches his son Ali Akbar Khan and Ravi Shankar. And, Baba marries, his, and marries his and daughter worships, to Ravi Shankar. And worships at, at a temple of Ma Sharda. That is, that is the great founding of classical Indian Bismillah music. Bismillah Khan? Huh? Bismillah Khan Bismillah and Varanasi. Bismillah Khan Practices and Varanasi. Practices on the banks of the Ganga yeah. in front of a temple and salutes that temple. Absolutely. So that and and uh, to catch and in your and to talk about popular culture in Rajasthan, there is the Ramdiara tradition, which is a very very. How many people are actually residents of the state of Rajasthan here? Okay, then one of the most popular. God's here is Baba Ramdev Am I in Ramdeora. There is a Sufi link to that shrine in Ramdeora. It is not far from where India did the nuclear test, by the way. Not far from that site. But whatever it is, it is where there is a Sufi link. This is our culture, this is our religion, this is our faith. There is no classical music without Hindus and Muslims working together on it. And that is high culture and Baba Ramdev is popular faith. It is popular culture. You look at the musicians of Rajasthan. Just look at your Manganya singers. And Langas. Look at your Langa singers. We can just go on and on and on about all of that, you know? Uh, Raghavendra, you, you know, in this whole tradition of resilience, at the end of the day, the monuments may fall apart. They may all come down. What has survived across millennia is our stories, is the intangible. Uh, that we see every day performed, whether in the form of a street Ram Leela or the burning of a Ravan or Holi or Durga Puja, whatever. What is it that you feel that can be done to continue in that tradition, the great tradition of passing stories on from generation to generation, especially today where the threat is when you migrate from, say, a village or a town, which has been your ancestral place forever, you lose your links. You leave that behind and you move to a Bombay or a Delhi, like many of us have. How do you then preserve that intangible 
or not just preserve, how do you ensure that that legacy sort of continues? Is that part of you know, the larger vision? I know you've been saying, I want to open up our museums, I want to open up our spaces. The two things, one of course, when I said that, with which I closed it, because you suddenly switched to, to, to another question. Uh, the idea was actually that obviously the government can't do everything on its own. Uh, you have to actually bring in people from all across and people have to own it up. So when I went to Calcutta and we opened up these four or five places, I kept on meeting all the, across the section, cross section, people in Kolkata and I said, unless and until you own these places up, unless and until you sort of make them vibrant, do things over here uh, and do it for free. I mean, we will sort of come forward, we will have, so basically you will have to then strengthen mechanisms which invite private or uh, public participation. So that's, that's one. Without that, you can't do it. On the issue of intangibles, uh, uh, like Jamie was just saying that, uh, you know, the people who come to uh, most of his libraries in, in UK, uh, unlike that, what I have been actually noticing, say you go to the National Library and our National Library, and then you suddenly find that, okay, there are people there, but what are they reading? Are they utilizing the resource which National Library has? Unfortunately, no. Whatever is being utilized uh, is uh, something most of the students bring it with themselves. It's a nice atmosphere over there. They just sit and read. Uh, or uh, they just hang around there preparing for competitive exams. That is the kind of situation which I have personally seen with my own eyes in National Library. But you see, you venture out and you go into the beaten street of Calcutta, every third or fourth building, which is heritage building, has libraries which have, uh, you know, books. You know, you sort of pick up a book and it'll crumble in your hand because it's 200 year old, right? So whether you call it tangible or intangible, it has to be preserved, right? So similarly, all the stories have to be preserved. So it's a gargantuan challenge, but we have to somewhere start. The slate is, I mean, I must say it's quite clean. Uh, so whatever you do on it adds to it, but the challenge is humongous. Uh, Pavan, did Gandhi have a sense of how to marry popular culture and pick up on the traditions of this country, whether it was traveling the length and breadth, doing the salt march, picking up the charkha and bringing out that syncretic tradition of weaving? You see, Mahatma Gandhi was a genius. He was not only a saint, Mahatma, but he was a genius. And he had this effortless way of bridging high culture in terms of nobility of thought with what can be sung not necessarily as part of high culture. He had the ability to bridge personal faith with personal belief. I give you an example. And he used to sing this the most, very often in all his prayer meetings. Just look at these two lines, which synthesize personal faith with courage of conviction and belief, and which marry high culture because of the nobility of thought with what is imperative as part of our resilient legacy. Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram Patita Pavan Sita Ram That's personal faith. Ishwar Allah Tero Naam Sabko Sanmati De Bhagwan. Ishwar Allah Now here is someone who first asserts as part of his cultural inheritance, his, the validity of his personal faith, Raghupati Raghav Raja Ram. And at the same time, much in the Upanishadic tradition, has the audacity to say, that which I worship can be called by different names, Ishwar Allah Terona. Now that, that is the genius of Mahatma Gandhi. And by the way, that inspiration which comes from the sap of our soil 
from the lived history and culture was carried on by Hindi cinema. It's Hindi cinema who said, Tu Hindu banega na Musalman banega, insan ki aulad hai, insan banega. You won't be, you are not a Hindu nor a Muslim necessarily, you are insan ki aulad. You are a person of God. In simultaneous translation bhi karwa rahe hai, bada mushkil. I've, I've, I've translated Gulzar Saab and Kefi Azmi and Ghalib and Atal Bihari Vajpayee, but this is impossible. Yeah. If this was TV, we would have had subtitles so, below, so sir. I just, I just want to say, and you know, I slightly disagree with Sanjoy when he says, if you move from a village to a town, there is some part of your legacy that you leave behind. I don't agree. These legacies go on with us because they are part somewhere of our inherited DNA. But I mean, sorry, I don't want to say Hindi. Uh, but, but it's not as if, if you geographically relocate yourself. Yes, there could be the anonymity, the loneliness of a metropolitan city which puts you adrift from some of your cultural practices, some of which is very good because some of our cultural practices of an orthodox nature, of an obscurantist nature, we need to leave behind. But much of it continues within us. Let us not distort that. Rahi Masum Raza, in one of his poems, says about the town where he was born. Ye galiyan. Mera bachpan yahaan se guzra hai. He went to Mumbai later. Ye galiyan mera bachpan yahaan se guzra hai. Kahaniyan jo suni thi yahaan pe soti hai. They are asleep with me as part of me. They will be with me. They will inspire me. These are my stories. I will live by them. My stories, they will live with us. Pratyusha, what is the responsibility of, of the medium that you're part of today? There was a time where much of television started dumbing down because they thought that they were reaching out to people who wouldn't necessarily understand uh, the nuances. But today, most of you are now looking at stories from the written or the oral texts, and that's become a thing. But what is the responsibility? I think uh, the... We, we think of TV as the spoken word medium of today. Uh, it is what kind of reflects today and lets today's culture thrive and go forward. Um, talking about the responsibility, I think uh, that's something which I spoke about uh, a little while back. That whole Bedharak Bharat, which is really rising, which is, you know, if you, if you walk across the street many a times now, you would see people wearing this T-shirt, Apna Time Aayega. There is that rising spirit, and how can we tell those stories? How can we, I mean, we're really looking at democratizing storytelling. You can look at stories two ways, right? You can see them as an addiction, uh, and you can give more of the same, and you know, that'll give you a dopamine boost. But that addiction can also be a fuel. And if you really tap into the subcultures, the ambitions, the relationships that are really touching you, I think that's when you're truly uh, not just a representative of culture, but really fueling the culture and kind of navigating with it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Jamie, in India, uh, art or literature or, or is very much a part of the political narrative of the time. And it's always been, it's very much been both. Is it different in Europe? Is it different And looking at the Brexit uh, movement that happened uh, and the vote recently, did that bring about a churning as well? Did it bring, around a did it bring about a churning? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm not sure you can generalize across Europe even, because I think different European countries probably have a different perspective uh, on that question. Um, certainly in France, for example, actually the, 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 the culture of literature and writing is very, very at the heart of uh, politics and politicians. Uh, there's probably in the UK, as in so many areas, more of a pragmatism uh, and perhaps more, more of a distance. But in terms of Brexit, 
I think, and I thought we were going to get through the session without mentioning it, but apparently we haven't. You have a week to go or two weeks to go? Uh, less than, this time next week, uh, yeah, this time next week we will, we will have left the European They're Union. They're Mexited and Brexited, both. <laughs> Uh, we haven't Mexited yet, but we've got her for another couple of months, I think. Um, but, but no, I mean, Brexit's a great example of precisely why we need the fluidity and the ambiguity even, um, and the empathy that you get in storytelling and literature. It's, it's been um, a real shock, I think, for many people in the UK. Not because they agree or disagree with Brexit, there's, there's honourable arguments on both sides, but the degree to which cultural life has been so polarized by Brexit, where people, individuals, are being defined by one thing, by the way that they voted on that referendum a few years ago. And it's more complicated than that. It's much more complicated than that. Uh, and the more that we can get away from that, that polarization, that binary understanding of it, and the more that we can bring the writers uh, and the creatives in to, to begin to explore the, the, the complexity of it all, I think the more healthy uh, the discussion will be. Before I open up, up to the audience, Sabah, for folks in the UK, in Hong Kong, in Egypt, in Turkey, in China, in America, here, apna time aiga? Will our time apna, come? Should I, do I translate it? Translate. Can I translate I it? Will apna our time, time come? Aiga. <laughs> I'll translate it. means our time will come. This comes from an Indian, uh, a song in an Indian film, Jamie, where there's this young man who's uh, sort of anti-system and there is also a song playing in the background which is about Azadi, which means freedom. So there's a lot of subliminal messaging in that film. And uh, he says, my time will come. And he becomes a rap star, a local Indian rap star. So that's, that's what it's about. Our time will come and that sort of captured that movie, I think earlier last year it captured a mood and now we have protests all over Indian universities. It's actually happening. I'm not making this up. I swear, I promise, even though I'm accused of everything, in a, I'm not making it up, it's a factual accuracy. So, I, this, it's true, in, I mean, in spite of all efforts to pass it off as fake news, it's actually happening, students everywhere are protesting, especially in the national capital, from where I've come, where two universities witnessed violence. I think all of you would know that, you know? So, uh, that, and they're there, and they, they're being so creative about it. And I really uh, implore all of you, get away from the politics, whether you support this side, as Jamie said, get away from the politics, get away from the binaries, just go and see the artwork on the wall of Jamia University. You have not seen anything like it. I have been to Belfast. I've seen the sort of peace graffiti. Walls. The peace that, wall. I've seen that. This is some kind of creative stuff happening on the streets of India. It's sort of quite spectacular. That's so many more questions to ask, but let's ask the audience. What I'm going to do is ask you all to just, we'll do clusters of questions and come back so we can take more. Uh, let's start right from the back if there are any questions because they never get to ask. So. Uh, the one blue, uh, yeah, if you could stand and get the mic go. I'll keep the question short, please, and just introduce your name. Hello, uh, I'm Anura. Uh, my question is to Sabah, ma'am. You talked about... Where um, are you? Where are you? There. Where? Straight in front of you. Oh, okay, okay. You talked about Delhi and student protests, and there was a differentiation made between pop culture and culture culture. Do you think that pop culture is now going on, like it's appropriating culture culture because we see people, students say, uh, writing poetry. So they take protest slogans from the streets and put it in their poetry. And maybe their poetry is in English and those who are pro protesting, they might not even understand what they're saying. So do you think pop culture is appropriating culture culture? Thanks. Thank so, so hold so on to that. Think, Sabha, hold on. Uh, in front here. Remember your question. I'll come to you. And then the, the, the lad in the, just stand up. Yeah, stand up. Yeah. Uh, my question is to uh, Sabha and uh, Pawan. So, uh, you said about to Hindu, Muslim and all. Uh, my question is to you that, uh, don't you think that uh, BJP and RSS is not doing Hindu, Muslim, but actually you are doing that? Because Indira Gandhi never used to use uh, uh, Hindu party for the BJP, actually the Jansang. Uh, it was Rajiv Gandhi 
Uh, he used to use Hindu party and then Shah Bano and then Ram Mandir Tala and then after the growth of BJP is uh, okay. And uh, whenever you say Ham, Ham, dekhenge, then Chapak is uh, gone down. The What's the question? Is What's uh, the question? Uh, I think that uh, there is a nexus. Uh, What's the question? Of political party, and uh, that's why some other party is uh, going, uh, growing, continuing the 303 and all. Uh, so please answer. What's the question? Is there a question? I think that uh, uh, we're BJP not asking what you think. We're not doing Hindu Muslim. You guys are doing Hindu Muslim, and that's why Indira Gandhi gets power after seventy. Okay, so there's 80. no question. But Thanks. Thank you, uh, the young lad. No. Hello, I am Dhruv. So now, as you all talk that there's a variety of cultures in India, one of the most prominent things is the uniform civil code going in. So do you think it is a, a, a way, a, it is a threat to our culture, or do you think it will end the social evils as this is some orthodox practices? Uh, my question is open to anybody who would like to answer this. Okay, one sec. One more question from, uh, is there a lady in the audience who wanted to ask a question? Yep, right there. My question is to the lady here. Just, just please, uh, uh, yeah. closer. Uh, my question is to the lady here. You're saying about fueling culture. And what I come to know about, not that I watch television, but I know that you know the number one rated television show is Nagin these days. So do you think... It's, it's, it's if, okay, it is one of the top, probably, right? And if that is the case, how are we fueling culture? Is that fueling culture? So the question is, Nagin, a number one television show, sorry, I'm also somewhat ignorant. Is that fueling culture, so I, a pop culture yeah, to I've you? I've got the pop culture one, so uh, I'm, I'm leaving everything else to Pavan, incomprehensible question. Okay, pop culture, uh, to the student there, uh, there is no, po uh, there, you know, culture is a very flexible, one culture weaves into another culture. There is nothing static called culture. So what the students are doing out there, writing poetry, writing compositions, performing composition, that is popular culture. And if you notice, when we talked about the film Gully Boy, that uh, song which starts off with the backdrop of the Azadi song, that came from a slogan in a university, which the filmmakers then took and put into, a, put into the cinema. So culture goes and it touches all of us. And so what the students are doing is, I believe today, creating popular culture. And some of the music, some of the compositions, they are spreading, they're listening to that. And there are these student renditions. And that particular Hum Dekhenge, just to get to the diversity point, has been performed. There is a, now a Tamil version, there is a Kannada version. It's being performed in multiple languages. You know, so uh, that's that's what's happening. Culture. Do you want to just touch on Nagin? I, I want to. Uh, I'll come to Nagin. I just wanted to add to that pop culture bit, and I think uh, how Sir mentioned about how Gandhiji was like the epitome of taking the nobility of thought and making it pop culture. I think uh, that's what's happening currently. Uh, there is, and arts really give us that chance. Arts and uh, storytelling and music gives us that chance to take a thought, a concept, a spirit, a junoon, and make it mass popular. And ma'am, uh, I would actually really invite you all to watch some TV. Um, there was, and I can't talk about competition. Firstly, Nagin is not the top rated show. It's one of the shows. Like I said, there is two kinds of storytelling. You can be an addiction because horror gives you a dopamine rise. Uh, certain kind of genres give you a dopamine rise and you can addict people with that. But there is also other dopamine highs where I'll tell you the biggest story and the topmost story in Hindi markets is a story called Kumkum Bhagya. It's usually dismissed off as, it's called Kumkum Bhagya, it's a Z story. This is the classic Cinderella story. A ugly duckling girl wants a rock star. And the story goes on. It's been going on for four and a half years now. It's more than a thousand episodes. People identify, especially in TV storytelling, with the character. The spirit that a girl sitting in Bareilly identifies with is the spirit that I can make my life happen. That apna time aega spirit is why a girl sitting in a Bareilly uh, bonda basti says that I can be her, I can aspire to be her. She is working, she's managing her home. Those are hope, the stuff that hope. matters. It's about hope yeah, as it's well. About, it's about himmat. I and say hope has a little bit of 
hope and, for, and yeah, fortitude. I, I will fortitude. take charge of my destiny. And I think those are the stories and those are the trends that are doing well. Another story, sorry, I just want to add on, which does beautifully well. Again, I'll talk about a Z2V story. Is about a story called Rapta. It's about a mother-daughter relationship. Everybody thinks of TV as Saas Bahu Sajish, but this is another really big story currently on television. It takes off from the trend of how children are the new parents. So this is about the girl who is playing the mother, who evolves into a mother to her mother. So you're taking the trend of how children know more than parents today. So I think the responsibility of looking at what's happening in this country and bringing those stories, those evolving relationships is really how we see. And in fact, here's an open um, invitation to all of you. Don't look down upon TV. We're here to tell stories of this Bedarak Bharat. So if any of you have a story to tell about the Bedarak Bharat, please, we're here. We're all here Thank to you. create a story. Pavan, uh, Uniform Civil Code and Rajiv Gandhi versus whatever the comment was. Indira, no, Indira Gandhi no. versus... Uh, are we, are we no, let's, let's be realistic. This is a country where there are many faiths. Four of the world's greatest religions were born in India. Hinduism, Jainism, Buddhism and Sikhism. And for Islam, we have one of the largest adherents in the world living in our country for centuries now. But it has been a recent trend whereby your identity as a citizen is somehow linked to your religion. If, and I say this without being politically partisan, if the Prime Minister, for instance, says that you can identify protesters by the clothes they are wearing. Then, then, then somewhere you are emphasizing the religious identity of the protesters to which the protesters themselves have given a resounding and befitting reply that we are not Hindus, we are not Muslims. We are Indians and will be fighting as Indians. That, that, is the, that is the answer. So, therefore, therefore, we have our respective faiths. We respect all faiths. But we have always, and the constitution stresses it, we have been Indians first. If it is happening today, it is happening because there are responsible spokespeople who speak of Hindu Rasht. I'm a very proud Hindu. I have more books relating to Hinduism, if not more, quite a few. My last book was on Adi Shankaracharya, Hinduism's Greatest Thinker, which continues to be a national bestseller. I'm a proud Hindu, but I will not say that India is for Hindus alone, because I see India as for Indians, irrespective of your faith. As far as the Uniform Civil Code, may I answer that? You see, the Uniform Civil Code is a very serious business. It's part of our directive principles of the Constitution. The state must strive for it. But you cannot use the Uniform Civil Code to selectively target one religion for reform and ignore what is the reform that is required to be done in other religions. For instance, when the Chairman of the Law Commission wrote to the Chief Minister of Bihar, on his response to the Uniform Civil Code, and I was responsible for drafting the reply partly, we said, kindly produce a draft. It's a laudable goal. We support it. It's part of the Constitution. Kindly produce a draft for discussion where you tell me what part of all the religions you will keep and what you will take out. For instance, in Hindu marriage, there is a ceremony called Kanya Daan, where the girl is almost treated as a commodity to be donated at the time of marriage. Given away. Given away. Today, we are living in, in a period of gender equality. Most of the time, men are given away. <laughs> men have given up. Or given up. <laughs> so, so, therefore, 
for those who want the uniform civil code which i would welcome also it's a very serious business where you must go into every religion with empathy with clinical clarity and say this is then the uniform practice that we will follow but do not use it only for the selective targeting of one religion as if all the evils are in that religion one line uh pavan said gender but i just women are leading women are, women are the leaders man well, Sh shobha women just lectured dilipta just now <laughs> you know? sort of gave him a long we lecture we are not there's no equality we are uh, leading in no, every no, protest no. we are there right in front and so i have no, women no. Uh, I, I, in club zindabad to the women of india i have no option Hello, but to agree i have no option but to agree go ahead hello sir my uh, my name is anurag and my question is to pavan sir what are some of the new practices that we can create to uh, we, that we can adopt to create cultural diversity and resilience for future say no to intolerance ek mantra say no to hatred to violence say no to hatred to violence say no Use to culture say no to policies of division and by the way let me add a footnote quickly here look at the alchemy of your country and look at where this entire subject of debate comes to a pointed focus this is a hindu dominant country 80% plus are hindus minorities are minorities and yet when this policy of trying to divide people on the basis of religion as interpreted by the young was tried to be foisted what have the young said the young have said no we do not want this policy of divide and rule therefore i say say no to intolerance to violence to hate to division on that note ladies and gentlemen i'm really sorry i'm having to wrap up but uh, i know there are millions more questions this is one of the most emotive discussions this is what this is what it's about it's about culture and tradition uh, thank you all just to remind you at the end of the day that all of this is just in the continuum of time a notch our time social media i know tends to dominate we tend to see we tend to be overwhelmed by what's happening out there but the tradition of empathy peace love celebration in india and across the world will continue as long as each one of us celebrate from birth to death our culture Thank you all very much. Thank you, our wonderful panel. Thank you very much, and on to the next session. Thank you so much. Mr. Man, on behalf of everyone here at the Nexa Front Lawn, let's please thank all these speakers on an illuminating session on culture and resilience, recurring themes at the Z Jaipur Literature Festival. Big thank you also to Mahindra World City Jaipur, who were the sponsors for this session. Ladies and gentlemen. you can find sabha nakwi raghavendra singh and pavan k verma signing books at the z kiosk just behind you towards the right at the session in just a few minutes uh, we will be commencing the next session which is titled plasi the battle that changed the course of indian history this is the title of a book by sudeep chakravarti who, uh, and will be launched by namita gokhale with whom the author will also be in conversation this will commence in just a few minutes right here at the nexa front lawn thank you